Welcome to this China talk on eco conservation and sustainable development in China. Before I start, I'd like to thank the organizers for this opportunity to share some of my observations of China's efforts and achievements in eco conservation and sustainable development in the last few decades. And I would like also to thank you all for your interest in this particular talk. As you can see from the epigraph in this particular slide, this epigraph reads in Chinese, 绿水青山就是金山银山, and it literally means lucid water and lush mountains are valuable assets, or more simply, green mountains are gold mountains. I suppose this epigraph captures how the Chinese people and the Chinese government perceive eco-conservation and sustainable development these days. In today's talk, I will start with an overview of the problems and achievements in general before focusing our attention on two of the most high profile areas of eco conservation and sustainable development in China, namely smog and deforestation. While China's economy is keeping its pace along the fast rail, China's environmental protection efforts have been subjected to criticism. Reports on China's poor performance in eco-conservation are commonly found in Western media. The question seems to be, China is doing economy first or environment first? According to a survey by Peer Research Center in March 2020, that's already amid the coronavirus pandemic, as many as 61% American respondents believed that China's impact on the global environment is a major concern to the US. Copying the list of what China's impact on, uh, what China related issues can be a problem for America and beating many of the other high profile issues, as you can see here. So the question is, is it that bad? Or is it that the Chinese people don't care? In fact, the Chinese people are even more concerned with the environmental issue. In 2020, an old man named Wang Chunru from Shijiazhuang City, the capital city of Hebei province, became phenomenal in China's social media. Mr. Wang has been taking a picture of the same sky from the same spot each day since 2014 to record the changing air quality in Shijiazhuang. He got the idea when the smog problem became particularly serious in 2013. In the last eight years, he has taken over 2,300 pictures, which put together visualize the improvement of air quality in his hometown, as you will be able to see in the air quality photo bar chart 2014 to, 20, uh, 2014 to 2020 in the slide. The statistics of the Environment Protection Bureau of Shijiazhuang have verified his findings. From 2013 to 2020, the total number of excellent air and good air days increased by 161 days. A Reuters report on January 31st of this year says China's average national smog levels were down by 9.1% in 2021 compared with those of 2020, while the percentage for the Beijing, Tianjin, Hebei region, which is the region suffered most from poor air quality, that same level was down by 5.7%. So people are watching and the whole country has been making relentless efforts. Mr. Wang Shunru's camera records not just the sky outside his balcony, but also vividly documents China's great achievements in the treatment of air pollution in the last decade. In this, during this period, strong uh, smog treatment and desertification control constitute the two major focal points in China's environmental protection campaign. Then in this campaign, we have been who have been doing what to control, to promote eco-conservation in China. 
So this is the question we aim to answer in today's talk. This talk on one hand aims to demonstrate how China has resolutely discarded the old way of economy first, environmental protection later. Actually, China has made eco-conservation and sustainable development a key element of its development strategy. On the other hand, this, says, this talk wishes to be a window through which you may see more clearly China's solid efforts and great achievements in the form of balanced development between eco-conservation and economic construction. So let's start with the smog problem and China's war on smog. So China's smog problem has been widely covered in Western media, reports and images of hazy cities, smoky chimneys and masked faces were commonly found. Actually, if you search China smog on Google, you will get over 14 million entries. Such attention has been consistent, even in the middle of COVID-19 pandemic. Indeed, smog has been the most high profile environment issue in China. Such widespread concerns started primarily in 2013, when over 100 cities in 25 provinces across China were hit by the worst smog in 52 years. The Beijing, Tianjin, Hebei region was hit hardest on the head. On, from December the 2nd to the 14th, 2013, serious smog swept across central and east China provinces, hitting them with level six serious pollution. That is the worst air quality in China's air quality index. With a daytime visibility range of only dozens of meters, school classes were suspended, airline flights canceled, expressways closed off, and bus services had a, had a timeout. So the 2013 nationwide smog served as an awakening call to China. Efforts to combat smog have been consistent ever since. So in this national campaign against smog in the last eight years, China has developed a three-dimensional smog treatment model featuring three pillars, namely, as you can see here, government leadership, corporate responsibility, and public participation. So next, we will look at each and see how it actually works. The zero smog in 2013 actually received more than enough attention from the central government. On September the 10th, 2013, the State Council of China issued the Action Plan of Air Pollution Prevention and Control, or more commonly known as the 10 Air Pollution Prevention and Control Measures. According to the Action Plan, China aimed to reduce the PM 2.5 level in urban areas by 10% by 2017. In 2018, the State Council issued another key guiding guideline concerning the battle against the smog, that is the three-year action plan to protect blue skies, stressing targeted policy execution and control. So with this improved top-level design, local governments have actively developed their respective action plans accordingly. For years, prioritizing GDP once blinded local governments to smog and other environmental issues, when only economic growth mattered. Even after the central government issued the targeted environmental protection plan, some local governments still created a two-year buffer period for some heavy polluting enterprises, which happened to be important contributors to local GDP. So fully aware of such play the touchable behavior, the central government explicitly stressed the supervision, quote, the supervision of the local government's implementation and execution of environmental protection regulations, laws, and policies, end quote. However, accountability could be willful, and it is always, um, always fell victim to human factors like an uh, undetermined the superior or a low level of um, public, pa um, public particip participation. 
To tackle the problem, the Ministry of Environmental Protection then, now it is the Ministry of Ecology and Environment. So back then, the Ministry put forward the concept of quantitative accountability in 2017. By quantitative accountability, it means the Ministry will summon the mass of the three cities with the worst performance in improving air quality every year to account and explain for their poor performance in air quality treatment. Such practice has been a spur pushing local governments to take concrete actions for feasible improvement. Later, the Ministry of Ecology and Environment carried out an environmental uh, inspection across China. And after that, there was a round of so-called in Chinese, Hui Tou Ka, or looking back campaign to check if local governments have been taking consistent efforts in air pollution treatment. So basically, this kind of determination and resolution of the central government pushed the local governments to try their own best to develop and implement their environmental inspection plans. So I would, give, I would use Fujian province as an example. In 2013, Fujian province started its own provincial environmental hotline, 12369, so for the local residents to report environmental pollution and misconduct, the, the public can dial the hotline directly or log on to the 12369 environmental whistleblower WeChat official account. And by, 20, by 2016, this 12369 joint environmental whistleblower management platform had become operational across China. So besides government efforts, enterprises, especially energy enterprises in China, have played an active role in protecting the blue sky by optimizing industrial structure, promoting green development, restructuring energy supply, so as to build a clean, low carbon and high, proficient, high efficiency energy system. So let's watch a short video, which will give you a glimpse of the efforts made by, the, by Chinese energy enterprises supported by green finance provided by Chinese financial institutions and see how much they have done. Now, let's watch this short video first. Just a minute, I oh, will, I need to screen share. The Beijing Tianjin Hebei region, known as Jingjinji, has the highest level of air pollution in China. Particularly during winter, the region is often engulfed in heavy smog lingering for days, and posing a serious health threat. The government of China has declared war on air pollution and issued the Air Pollution Prevention and Control Action Plan. Through the innovative financing for air pollution control in Jingjinji program, the World Bank and the Huaxia Bank are working together to help implement the action plan. With $500 million commitment from each, the program provides financing for businesses' investments in energy efficiency, renewable energy, and pollution control in Jingjinji and the surrounding provinces of Shandong, Shanxi, Henan, and Inner Mongolia. Coal burning for winter heating is a primary source of air pollution and a key area for clearing the air. In China's coal capital, Datong, with financing from the program, Wangping Power Company installed two new heat recovery units. Previously released into the air, the waste heat from electrical production is now captured and reused to heat homes in Huairen County. Huairen County has 240 tons of coal and 880 tons of coal. 一共是十台锅炉，来保证全全县人民冬季取暖。现在呢，通过我们厂向它供热，这可以说全部取缔了这些小锅炉。Qingyuan Food Company in Shandong Province makes noodles, biscuits, and other food products, while its power plant also supplies heat to local residents. 
Through the program, the company has increased its generating capacity and efficiency to provide heat to 300,000 people and steam to 160 small enterprises, replacing 35 small inefficient and polluting coal-fired boilers. Ultra-low emission desulfurization and denitrification devices have also been installed in all their boilers. Use of clean, renewable energy is also an effective solution to air pollution caused by fossil fuel. While China is the global leader in solar photovoltaic generation, financing and rooftop space are among the main constraints on distributed solar PV development. In the provincial capital Jinan, the Shandong Transportation New Energy Company has taken an innovative approach to overcoming the issue by installing distributed solar PV systems along highways, in the roundabouts, and near the tunnel exits, and on the rooftops of tow stations and rest areas. The electricity produced is sold to the state power grid. The company has also opened a kilometer-long stretch of solar highway, the world's first, for testing. Since September 2016, the Innovative Financing for Air Pollution Control in Jinjinji Region Program has made good progress. We have received 13 这十三个子项目总的投资额达到了六点六亿美元。after a year of implementation, we have made substantial progress. We leverage five times the World Bank loan. The program is making important contributions to the blue sky in Jinjinji. The program is also making important contributions to mitigate climate change. It has reduced CO2 emissions by 1.4 million tons. So with this short video, actually, you will be able to see how the energy enterprises and the financial institutes, institutions in China have been working from the supply side to combat smog. Well, Chinese enterprises on the consumption side are also taking active measures. As you will be able to see from the slide, I will use SGMW, a leader in new energy automobile in China, as an example, to show how the um, consumption side enterprises are trying to help or to facilitate China's uh, campaign against the smog. Now, according to the action plan of air pollution prevention and control, the first measure actually is to, quote, strengthen the treatment of mobile pollution, end quote, which means to promote the use of new energy vehicles and green transport. As a renowned automobile manufacturer based in Liuzhou City, Guangxi province, SGMW is determined to catch the opportunities in green development. By working closely with the Liuzhou municipal government, SGMW has successfully cleared all the common obstacles faced by new energy vehicles. Such cooperation is featured with government support, support with policy and public resources and the corporate supply of products and technology. Or, in other words, SGMW will produce high quality, cost effective new energy vehicles, while the government works to build charging facilities and develop relevant management systems and subsidy policies. By September 2021, last year, Liuzhou has built over 30,000 chargers all around the city. So at this moment, the car-to-charger ratio in Liuzhou is about 3 to 1. And 
any EV driver can find a charger within 10 minutes, no matter where he is in Dodo City. In 2021, SMGW's mini EV, <clears throat> as you will be able to see from the very cute uh, picture in the slide, sold altogether 420,000 cars in China, making itself the best selling EV model in the China market, outperforming Tesla's Model 3 and Model Y. Also in last year, SGMW's Mini EV was the second most selling EV model in the world market after only Tesla's Model 3. But don't forget, SGMW Mini EV are sold mostly only in the China market. Moreover, SMGW was only the second largest new energy automa automaker in China after BYD. So you were able to see how the automobile manufacturers in China have been working hard to reduce carbon emission from you know, oil burning car, oil burning cars. There is something interesting with the development and the use of the what the popularity of mini EV. Um, in Liuzhou City, there is the mini EV trunk market. This is Liuzhou's efforts to promote street vending, which was advocated by the government to stimulate economic, economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. SGMW's EV drivers turn their trunks into showcase windows and eventually turn traditional messy markets into a much more environment and people-friendly form of night markets. So smog has become a major threat to people's health and daily life. When smog comes, windows are closed, babies are no, are no longer thrown in sunlight, and joggers have to kind of halt their training routine. Governments and corporates have been called on to take measures to treat smog and to give people back their lives. However, it is life itself, to be honest, that ultimately creates smog the burning coal for heat in the north, the gas emission exhausted from you know, private cars, and the smog from barbecue stands. So government endeavors alone can hardly successfully expel smog and bring back blue skies. It takes the commitment and effort of every citizen to ensure victory in the war on smog. The Chinese people are making efforts by calling 12369 hotline when they see misconducts and replacing their oil burning cars with EVs and hybrid cars. Relevant research on public participation in smog treatment has been particularly hot in China. Among all the ordinary Chinese who are making efforts, some pioneering figures have been taking active and effective actions. Here, I would like to introduce a, one of the pioneers, that's Ma Jun, the founder of the Institute of Public and Environmental Affairs, short, often shortened as IPE. He, with a degree in journalism, Ma Jun first worked as a reporter. His experience of working with an investigative report on river pollution pushed Ma Jun to uh, write his first book, Water Crisis in China. Since then, he has been an environment advocate and activist. To Ma Jun, um, in Ma Jun's eyes, the key to successful environmental campaign is information transparency, because he believes the main deficiency in China's environmental governance is not technology, not fund, not policy, but motivation and determination. To deal with the problem, IPE was founded in, 20, uh, in 2006 specializing in environmental information disclosure. In as early as 20, 2008, IPE published the air pollution map. In 2015, IPE launched the Blue Map app and webpage, which integrate live environmental data from 338 municipal governments in all the 31 provincial uh, regions in China. So the platform will integrate data on environment quality, emission and the pollutant monitoring, and the air quality index. If you're interested, you may log on to the website to have a look. So information transparency not only helps people become more aware of the pollution 
around them, but also involves the general public in, in environmental protection, which will eventually pressure emitters to comply with emission and discharge standards. In 2015, as a recognition of his landbreaking work, Ma Jun was awarded the Skull Award for Social Entrepreneurship. This is kind of the Nobel in environmental protection and making him the first Chinese to win the award. In the award presentation tribute, the committee put it this way, quote, in the past, the Chinese public did not have a way to trace and report industrial pollution. Ma Jun has filled the blank. By creating a public user-friendly platform, his work has enabled more and more people to take part in environment monitoring. About 2,000 enterprises have taken measures to clean their production accordingly, end quote. So in the last eight years, China has developed its own China model for smart treatment, integrating government leadership corporate responsibility and a public participation. On the Earth Day, on June the 5th, 2019, the Ministry of Ecology and Environment published the China Air Quality Improvement Report 2013 to 2018, which was the first systematic review of China's efforts and achievements in smart treatment during the six year period. According to the report, in 2018, China's national average PM10 level was 71 micrograms per cubic meter, down by 27% uh, from that of 2013. And in the first batch of 74 cities where environmental air quality standards were implemented, the average PM2.5 was 42 uh, micrograms per cubic meter, down by 42% compared with that of 2013. Now, in the three key areas of prevention and control, namely the Beijing Tianjin region, the Yangtze Delta, and the Pearl River Delta, if you happen to know about China's you know, um, geography, you will be able to know these three regions are, the ho are home to China's largest three clusters of um, municipalities. Now, in these three key areas of prevention and control, the average PM2.5 level dropped by 48%, 39%, and 32%, respectively. In particular, for the Pearl Harbor, uh, for the Pearl River Delta, uh, meeting air quality, the, the Pearl River Delta managed to reach to meet the air quality standards for four consecutive years. And because of this kind of achievement, the Pearl River Delta was no longer taken as a key area of prevention and control. Later on December the 27th, 2021, last year, Clean Air China, a non-governmental organization headquartered in Manila, the Philippines, published Atmospheric China 2021 progress of air quality control in China. According to the report, China's air quality has been improving for seven consecutive years. In 2020, China's national annual average PM2.5 level dropped to 33 micrograms per cubic meter, reaching China's national air quality standard for the first time. The average ratio of good air days in all the 338 um, prefecture cities and above reached 87%. That is about 7.7 .7 percentage higher than that of 2018. That is at the end of the China Air Quality Improvement Report by the Ministry of Ecology and Environment. So clearly, China's national air quality standard is relatively low according to the WHO standards. There's still a very long way for China to go. And actually, I have to confess, the air quality in Beijing today is not particularly good. It's a little bit smoggy. Now, as a resident in Beijing for almost 24 years, since my college years, my personal experience has also proven how much the air quality in general and the smog problem in particular have improved in Beijing. Although great achievements have been made, short of substantive reform of China's economic development 
model, energy structure, and industrial structure, smog will not be cured at the root. Compared with other development, uh, develop, developed countries, China is admittedly still a green hand in air quality treatment. There is still a very long way for us to go in fighting smog. However, we have achieved a lot in the last decade, so we are both determined and confident. Sorry. So at the end of this part, I would like I have prepared a slightly long video, it's about 10 minutes or so, to help you review the paths China has taken in smog treatment as a wrap up of the section on smog treatment. So let's have a look. Just a minute, I'm trying to get everything. All right, so let's watch this um, almost 11 minute video on China's achievement so far on smog treatment. You gotta have one of these things. It's a lifesaver. In China, it is a necessity. Oh, yeah, because you never know what the AQI is going to be. You need one of these things. I mean, especially in Beijing. I mean, come on, look at the sky. Maybe he's trying to be funny. I mean, I guess it's nice today. But one of the costs, some of the worst air quality in the world. The pollution is at alarming levels. Which closed schools and airports. But the buildings over there are barely visible. Most people are not outdoors, and if they are, many of them are wearing masks. Over the past four decades, China's economy has maintained high-speed growth and drawn worldwide attention with its achievements. However, the pollution that comes with it particularly that of the air, has also drawn worldwide attention. Smog was once even a sin in China. I remember before the first time that I came, everyone said to me, be careful of the air. Um, <laughs> I didn't really know what to expect. In my impression is continuous, uh, almost one week, uh, even longer. And also the area is not Beijing, not Hebei, is also including Shanxi, Shandong, and uh, Henan province. So it's large area and uh, long uh, time. The Great London smog at the end of the last century or early into this century in, in Los Angeles, the smog starting in the 40s, really for s several decades uh, around then. We have uh, similarities with London because of coal. We have uh, similarities with uh, Los Angeles because of the vehicle. But in, in total, we have, I think it's more complex and more difficult to handle. In 2013, the average number of smog days reached its highest record in China in 52 years. Smog seriously threatened people's health, their daily lives, and work. Its impact had extended to every socioeconomic aspect. Calls to tackle the smog were accumulating. But unlike London or Los Angeles, China's air pollution was more complicated and compounded by varying regional climates and environments. So the challenge to control the smog was more significant. Carol, you want to try it? <laughs> what do you think about the air quality in China? Of course, the pollution is all over in the world. London might be a little bit better, but we still got the same issues. Sometimes it's quite harsh, but most of the time it's all right. I find I don't have to wear a mask as often. But the overall trend is usually getting better in a decent Beijing. It took a while in the United States, my country, for us to pay attention to air pollution, and then once we did, it took a while to get a handle on it. Well, the Clean Air Act, it, which was passed in the late 1960s and really went into effect in a, around 1970, in London they passed uh, the London Clean Air Act, and in California they passed a similar kind of a law. Um, and it wasn't long after that that the air started getting cleaner. 
if you look at the history of uh, Los Angeles London, uh, it's more than 15 years. But today, we should not use in 15 years or 16 years because you have a more historic e experience. China has known a lot from, from U US and uh, Europe. 2012, China just issued the new air quality standards. That is the first time we put the PM 2.5 in national air quality standards. And then the following uh, the action plan, uh, 2013, you need the supporting to the legislation and uh, the, the standards and regulation. Smog control needs to be preceded by relevant legislation. China improved its dedicated laws, regulations, and emission standards while introducing new ones, preventing and controlling air pollution, and providing critical support for smog control. But the key to smog control and air quality improvement lies in eliminating the root causes and scientifically understanding what and how air pollutants are formed so that they may be prevented and controlled. China is resorting to technology to tackle smog and achieve its environmental protection targets. Oh, I gotta figure out a way to sell these masks. Whilst we haven't had this tool, so we took the tool out to do the measurement. We did the measurement in Beijing and also in Tibet, in Shanghai as well, mm -hmm. and in Wudang Mountains. Mm -hmm. Some measurement we did was in the relatively polluted environment. Mm -hmm. In comparison, we did in a clean environment, like mm -hmm. in Tibet and Wudang Mountains. Uh -huh. So by doing the comparison, you can see how the formation are different in uh -huh. different regions. Okay. We started to work on this about 10 years ago. Oh my yeah, before we work on it, the whole community in the world, we have no tools to marry them. Advanced science and technology and big data applications allow us to avoid a traditionally rigid management model in online monitoring, differential management, and staggering peak production. Data also makes pollution containment more accurate and efficient. We may by no means sacrifice our eco-environment for temporary economic development. We strive to maintain economic growth while effectively controlling pollution. I do believe that one of the things that China has going for it that could help to speed up um, progress is a real embrace of technology. There's been quite a bit of progress that's made in the, in the last few years in reducing emissions. Some people say that that's simply due to an economic slowdown. When you talk about the slowing down, actually in China, recent uh, 10 years, the decrease is a growth rate decrease, but it is still growth. <laughs> you, you say the Beijing's GDP is going up, which means the activity is increased and the total generation of the pollution is increased. But the actual situation is the total emission is decreased. We're never going to win if the only way that we're going to deal with pollution is to put it, take it outside the economy. Mm -hmm. We have to deal with it within the economy yeah, because we right. live within the economy. Yeah. In China, in different regions, we say the environment action will help to improve the economic pattern mm -hmm. more healthy, not only for environmental parts, mm -hmm. but also for market competition. Only by persevering in scientific control may the environment and economy develop in harmony. After five years of efforts, China achieved emission reduction results that took developed Western countries decades to attain. China's efforts in this regard once again draw global attention. The 2019 World Environment Day will focus on air pollution. This time as the host, China will showcase to the world its accomplishments in smog control. Even though like it's been better, like for me it's really not good. Like I'm really not used to it. Like because you really smell the the pollution too. Overall, it's getting better, but it still has a long way to go. It to me, it's there's sort of not an there's there isn't really that break point uh, because we're still having some kind of impact. It's like saying you know, I'm going to go on a diet, I'm going to lose 10 pounds, mm -hmm. but if at the end of the diet I go back to my old way of eating, mm 
mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to gain the 10 pounds back. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you really have to sort of change your lifestyle. And I think of it the same way when it relates to air pollution is we can use controlled technology to get to a certain point, mm -hmm. uh, but then we really have to sort of change the fundamentals about the way that we live on this earth. Yeah, fully <laughs> agree with you. We have a lot of working to do for the future uh, improvements. The environment is people's livelihood. Forest covered mountains are beautiful. The blue sky is a bliss. In 2018, the ratio of average good air days in 338 prefecture level cities and above was 79.3%, which was 1.3 percentage points higher than last year. In the past three years, Beijing achieved a reduction in PM2.5 pollution levels that took Los Angeles, US, 12 years to complete. China has made outstanding achievements in tackling air pollution. But if China wants to further significantly reduce the concentration of PM2.5 in the near future, and strives to increase the proportion of average good air days to the aim of over 80%, China needs to continue its race in winning the battle for blue skies. All right, so you were able to see um, China has been making relentless effort. Those government enterprises and the uh, ordinary people are all joining the battle. And more importantly, as you will be, be able to see, um, yes, we have not necessarily successfully conquered or put smog under control. But at this moment, we are more than confident that, you know, um, the future is going to be better. So this would be the first major issue, the smog treatment. Now, besides smog, actually, the other focal point in China's environmental campaign in the last decade is the certification control and accordingly afforestation. Now, before we go into details, uh, well, let's take a look at some statistics to have a quick overview of China's history of desertification and sand sandstorms. Now, in the memories of Chinese born in the 1980s and 1990s, especially those in South China, like myself, there are two images which actually capture our imagination about North China. One is white in color, that is mostly the beautiful fairyland-like snow-covered winter field because there's no major, uh, uh, there's no major snow, no snow to some, in some regions in, the, in South China. The other actually is brown, in which people, as you will be able to see in the two pictures here, people covered by hats, hoods, scarves, and masks struggle to move forward against heavy gales. Now, everything was brown or brownish. Now, the second picture clearly is an image of sandstorms in north of China. Historical records show that since 20, uh, 1949, China has uh, sandstorm has become more becoming a regular use in north and northwest China in winter and autumn. Sandstorms were destructive forces damaging the environment and hurting people's health and property. Now, in nineteen ninety in nineteen ninety three, the on May the fifth, the so called May 5th extreme sandstorm hit northwest China. In Gansu province alone, the storm devastated over 167,000 hectares of farmland and brought down 40,000 trees, causing a total direct economic loss of 236 million RMB, claiming 85 lives and hurting, injuring another 153 people. The black storm did not, uh, did not stop until the next day and make itself the worst storm, sandstorm in the history of PRC. Sandstorms are caused by desertification. Though natural causes do contribute to desertification, it is excessive reclamation that is to blame. China has been haunted by serious desertification, which brought tremendous harm to, large, to a very large proportion of its population. According to the State Environment Protection Administration, the predecessor of the Ministry of Ecology and Environment today, since the 1980s, 2,460 square kilometers of land is lost to desertification almost every year in China, equal to a medium-sized county. 
So about a third of China's territory is desertified. The Sanbei region, now please remember, keep this in your mind, I'm going to refer to Sanbei a lot. Sanbei refers to north, northeast, or and the northwest China region. Now this, the, so this Sanbei region is home to eight deserts, four sandy lands, and a vast Gobi land, covering a total land area of 1.49 million square kilometers, accounting for 85% of all desertification land in China. The Chinese government has attached great importance to solving the problems brought by desertification and sandstorms. In as early as 1956, China's first professional sand fixation and forestry station was established in Zhongwei City in Ningxiahui Autonomous Region. The nationwide desertification control campaign featuring the Sanbei afforestation program, that is, you know, to re to afforestate, to afforestate the Sanbei region. The Sanbei afforestation program started in 1978 to improve the eco-environment, reduce natural disasters, and protect the people. In 1979, the central government listed the Sanbei afforestation program as a key national economic development program. These, these 33 year program that is from 1978 until 2050 is divided into eight phases aiming to plant 35.7 million hectares of forests in the Sanbei region. Now China has entered a sixth phase. It is projected by 2050 the forest coverage rate in the Sanbei region will have increased to 14.95% from 5.05% in 1979. So at the very first, this very ambitious program did draw ridicule from many because green such a vast region was just too difficult. Well, indeed, desertification control is not easy. Only very few of the first group of tens of thousands of trees planted in the very beginning of the Sanbei program actually survived, but sand fighters refused to give up. With ingenuity and constant trial, the successfully identified different sand plants for different types of desertified land. The most well-known of all is the so-called wheat straw. As you will be able to see in the picture here, in the picture on the right, that actually is the wheat straw square. Now, if you look at the picture on the right, you see a green band cuts through the de desert. The green band actually are the Greenland on the both sides of the Baoto to Lanzhou Railway. This railway cuts through the Tangeri Desert for six times in Dongwei City. Now, many Western scholars actually, many years ago, for kind of predicted that the railway would be covered by sand in no more than 30 years. But until today, fully functional for 64 years, trains continue to run on this particular railway on this particular railway line. And Greenland is expanding on both sides of it. Now, all these attribute to a very simple technique. The technique I said just now, that's wheat straw squares. Now, there's a very interesting story about the wheat straw squares. It basically came to us as a um, surprise or not planned at, at all. To protect the Baoto to Lanzhou Railway, it is pivotal to control the desert. So at first, the Zhongwei Sand Fixation and Forestry Station tried many different ways to fix sand, like cobblestones and straw mats. However, a sandstorm could always easily cover everything. Then once some workers at the station planted wheat straws to spell in the sand the Chinese character of, as you will be able to see, the character Chinese characters, Zhong Wei Gu Zhaling. Now, uh, after a storm, part of most of their works disappeared, covered by sand again. But the squares in the character of Zhong and Gu, as you will be able to see, I highlighted them in red. There will be some squares in the character, Chinese character of Zhong and Gu. They survived. The workers were very excited and they started to try different shapes using wheat straws. In the end, 
It was proven that wheat straw squares of one square meter worked the best. Until today, the wheat straw squares are still the simplest, cheapest, and the most environmental friendly method of sand fixation. In, as early as 1977, at the 1977 UN Global Desertification Conference, Chinese representatives were invited to give a keynote speech on the wheat straw squares. The Zhongwei Sand Fixation Forestry Station, the birthplace of this particular technology, has been commissioned by the UNEP, UNDP, and FAO to offer international training programs to share the Chinese experience with the whole world. However, wheat straw squares alone are not enough to fix sand because wheat straw squares have only a life cycle of three years before they degrade. When sand is fixed, vegetation must be grown to have a lasting impact. The various plants which now grow inside wheat straws in the Sambay region are the survivors of the most strict selection. Workers at the Zhongwei Sand Fixation and Forestry Station made nine expeditions into the Tangri Desert, brought back dozens of local sand plant species, which later flourished in wheat straw squares. But the wrong species of trees might cause imbalance in water and thus greatly add to the challenge in sand fixation. Mistakes of this kind are not rare in China's history of afforestation and desertification control. For example, Zhongbei County in Hebei province is a major link in the Sanbei Afforestation Program and the Tianbei Jing Tianjin Sand Control Project. Um, poplar trees, as you will be able to see um, in the picture on the right, on the left, sorry, um, poplar trees were once grown in large numbers here. Back then, people believed sand dunes should ideally be covered by vegetation completely, while the wood belts of dense and tall trees are the best. However, since 2000, poplar trees started to die. Tall trees seriously depleted the underground water, break the water balance of the local ecosystem, and amplify wind erosion of soil. So later, the local government and the people started a project to replace all the dying poplar trees in 2014. Now, on the basis of their research and, and the tr different trials, Mongolian scotch pines and sea buckthorns are mixed to create new woods, which proved to be a great success. However, in Zhongwei city, sand fighters did not stop with success with wheat straw squares, but keep exploring new and better ways. In 1984, the Zhongwei Forestry Station pioneered so-called five-in-one sand fixation and control system. So the five refers to five different belts for sand control and fixation. So name the five um, belts would be cobblestone fire breaks, um, in irrigated forest belts, grass barriers, forward sand resisting belts, and sand fixation belts. The 5-in-1 system survived the May 5th extreme storm in 1993 I talked about just now, with only the two outer belts partially damaged, while the inner belts and the Boto to Lanzhou Railway were hardly touched by the extreme sandstorm. Researchers did not stop here. After trying various materials, they have also innovated the artificial sand crust technology, which makes full use of the clay's quality of forming crusts when mixed with water. Compared with wood straw squares, which degrade in three years, artificial sand crust can last much longer. Even with the help of advanced and technology and machinery, life of sand fighter in a hostile environment is hardly easy. The fight against desertification is even harder when human labor remains the primary weapon against the sand in many regions. China's great desertification control achievements, therefore, must be attributed to the people on the front line and the heroism of unremitting perseverance. I will give you three examples. Firstly, sorry. Firstly, in the Bucha Forestry Station on the south edge of the Tangri Desert in Gulan County, Gansu Province, 
three generations of six tree planters. All these people refer, refer to themselves as six tree planters, have worked with the same determination and courage. In 38 years, they have planted 40 million trees to foster a sand fixing uh, forest of 14,500 hectares. While in Yulin City, Shanxi province, since 1985, Niu Yuqing, this smiling lady here, has been working on a family contract to grow grass and trees to control sand in the south of the Muuzu Desert, the fifth largest desert in China. Now, in the last 30 years, she and her family had greened 7,400 hectares of land with their bare hands. While in Lingwu County in Ningxia, Wang Youdao has led his co-workers to promote sand fixation and control by growing a windbreak and a sand fixation forest of 40,000 hectares and bringing under control about 67,000 fixation, uh, 67,000 hectares of drift sand. These are just a few of the heroes in the fight against the desertification. In China, farmers believe in living at the mercy of the elements. However, desertification deprives people of the possibility of cultivating regular economic crops. In China, the western region took up two thirds of the territory, while one third of the western region is covered by deserts. So to control desertification, simply fixing and controlling sand and reducing sandstorms are not enough. From day one, we have been trying to put money in people's wallets. Otherwise, no real improvement will be made for the people. On one hand, the government encouraged forestry stations to start their own companies to create job possibilities and provide incentives to investors to invest in sandy regions. For example, 80 companies have been involved in desertification control and sand economic development in the Kubuch Desert. The sea buckthorn fruit is a case in point, as you will be able to see from the picture. The sea buckthorn grows very well in harsh cold, scorching heat, heavy wind, and dry land. That's basically the climatic feature of West region of China. Besides its own hardiness, the sea buckthorn can generate nutrients needed by other plants in soil so as to improve the growing environment for other types of vegetation. All these make it an ideal pioneer tree. More importantly, sea buckthorn fruits are exceptionally nutritious, with a high content of vitamin C than fresh Chinese dates and kiwi fruits. Gaining popularity among health and beauty-seeking customers, sea buckthorn fruits have become an important source of income to people in the local sandy regions. On December 19th, 2019, the Ma Sea Buckthorn Juice brand was launched with the support of Ant Forest by Alipay. More importantly, Alipay promised to donate all the profits made from its Sea Buckthorn Juice to China's Foundation for Poverty Alleviation to promote environmental protection and poverty alleviation in mid and west China. So besides now, besides farming, husbandry, and food processing, in recent years, desert tourism has developed and flourished in these sandy and desert regions. In 2013, China introduced National Desert Park System, which aims to integrate desertification control, eco-conservation, desert development, and tourism. Now, over 36 national desert parks have, have been built in Xinjiang alone, featuring Boundless sand dunes desert tourism has become a new name card of Xinjiang, Qinghai, and Gansu, some of these west, west um, provinces in China. Sand skiing, desert lakes, and camel riding are attracting more and more people to come. Actually, I had an experience of going there, and that is a very unforgettable memory and experience. Now, from conquering deserts to make use of them, we have started a benign circle between desertification control and poverty alleviation, which further promotes the endeavor to control desertification. 
the success of controlling sand with industrial development has manifested that eco-engineering brings economic opportunities, while the latter promotes the further development of um, eco-engineering. Um, eco now, we have covered how the government and the people have actively contributed to desertification, to desertification control. As is with smog treatment, Chinese corpor corporations actually are not absent. <clears throat> Chinese enterprises have been playing a very active role. Among all the efforts, the Ant Forest, launched by Alibaba in 2016, is probably the internet superstar public interest project for low carbon life and afforestation. Here, we have a five-minute video for you to have a preview of the Ant Forest project and how modern IT technology can help with afforestation. So let's have a look first. Just a minute. Every morning, students at Suzhou Institute of Construction and Communications get up on time to collect green energy on their mobile phones. Once enough green energy points have been collected, a virtual tree can be planted via the Ant Forest app. In the meantime, Ant Forest and it will plant a real tree in China's arid areas with most of the funding provided by Ant Financial. Every spring, Ant Forest organizes a planting tour in one of these arid areas for representative users to experience how the virtual trees on their apps are converted into real ones. Green energy can be generated by adopting a low carbon lifestyle such as paying utility bills online, walking or cycling to get around, or even by transferring points between friends. In order to earn more energy, students all collect their points first thing in the morning, when the green energy is ripe. <laughs> Since March 2018, in this school alone, more than 5,000 staff and students have joined Ant Forest, and they have planted 101 Scots pines in total. Apart from the staff and students from Suzhou, there is also Kyle Oberman, an American photographer dedicated to ecological protection in China. He is also a long-term fan of ant forest. Water, this is called a suo suo in Chinese. I'm gonna go. Apparently only to water it three times a year, that's what I heard. It's pretty incredible. But it just shows that, you know, using local species in the desert's the way to go. <laughs> By April 2019, Ant Forest had gathered the energy of 500 million people and planted 100 million real trees in China 
covering an area of 900 square kilometers, an area even bigger than New York City, and cutting 3 million tons of carbon dioxide. According to a report on China's carbon market released by the UN Development Program, Ant Forest's technological innovation based on digital finance has provided a unique solution to environmental problems and is seen as a great example to the rest of the world. According to NASA, the globe has become greener than it was 20 years ago. China and India can take one-third of the credit. For China, 42% of its contribution comes from afforestation projects. The Ant Forest marks the world's first large-scale project that combines individual low-carbon behavior and carbon management. According to China's national plan, the forest coverage rate will grow to 23.04% by 2020, from 21.66% in 2015 and 26% by 2035. Through planting trees via phones, <coughs> more people are actively engaged in this good cause. It will have profound implications for reducing soil erosion, air pollution, and promoting personal contributions to the global response to climate change. So this is basically what the Ant Forest is trying to do. It, it is making for you take advantage of the large user base of Alipay in China and encourage people to use you know, green finance to support the planting trees in the um, sandy regions in China. So because of its great achievement, uh, of, I mean, the and for it. In, 19, uh, in 2019, the UNEP awarded Anne Forest the Champion of the Earth Award. That is the UN's most renowned award for environmental protection. By August 2021, last year, over six, 60 million, no, over 600 million users have used their, have made their contributions to Anne Forest via their mobile phones, which added up to planting and maintaining over 326 million trees in the physical world, which cover, which should be able to cover a land area of 265,000 hectares. That is almost the size of the land area of the state of Rhode Island. The Ant Forest is innovative in the sense that it takes advantage of Alipay to give every person and a chance to take part in environmental protection, cultivate low carbon consumption, and promote a greener lifestyle. Now, e-finance innovations and smart environmental solutions have become a major driving force for China's eco-conservation and construction. Now, another major cornerstone, as I mentioned much earlier, to China's achievements in Set in uh, desertification control and afforestation would be the Sanbei Afforestation Program. By 2020, the program has built an living forest of over 30 million hectares, increasing the forest coverage rate of the program region from 50.5% in 1979 to 13.59% in 2018. The forest growing stock jumped from 740 million to 3.3 billion cubic meters. The Sambi forest has sequestered a total amount of 2.31 billion tons of carbon, equal to 5.26% of the total industrial carbon emission in the form of carbon dioxide from 1980 to, 19, to, from 1980, <coughs> sorry, to 2015 in China. <coughs> so by 2018, the forest coverage rate of the Muusu Desert, I mentioned just now when I was talking about uh, the six tree planters and Wang Yudao and 
New Yijing, um, the forest coverage rate of the Mu's Desert had reached 28.9%, as you will be able to see from the images on this particular slide. Chinese netizens delighted in seeing the Mu's Desert, originally the fifth largest desert in China, now disappearing from the Chinese map. Now, to make it more vivid and this picture and figures, I have prepared another video to document China's achievements in desertification control in a place called Aksu, next to China's largest desert. This short video should also serve as a brief wrap up for our talk on desertification control and afforestation and how much China, how much achievement China has made so far. So let's have a look at another short video. Um, the uh, desertification control and forestation in Aksu. Helpful students at Sujo. Sorry. This is the city of Aksu, located in China's Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Since 30 years ago, things have changed a lot. If you look closer, the added green from the satellite image actually stretches 50 kilometers wide. This is the result of an ambitious tree planting project looking to turn desert into, well, forest. Circa the 1980s, Aksu was not the place to be. Its close proximity to China's largest desert, Lamagan, <coughs> made it one of the driest and sandiest places in China. Overall, the city was covered in sand for over 100 days a year. The soil's high alkaline content rejected any effort to plant trees. Precipitation was close to non-existent. In 1986, the government decided something needed to change. That change took the form of the Kukuya Greening Project. Donkeys carried water from tens of kilometers away. Citizens from all corners of the city came to aid the effort in achieving the impossible. Policemen, doctors, students, the young and the old worked the field two times a year planting one at a time. So, how did they do? The numbers show they have fared quite well. From 1986 to 2018, 3.4 million people participated in the project, planting a total of over 13 million trees. The green you saw on the satellite image, well, that's roughly about 2.2 million acres of green that had not existed on Earth before. Dusty days reduced to averaging only 20 days a year. Not only have they done the impossible, Aksu has turned its hot and dry weather into something of an advantage. <coughs> Nowadays, you'll find some of the sweetest and crispiest apples grown here locally. Its other produce, such as dates and walnuts, have also become a hot grab in most grocery stores across China. Now, a new greening project is quietly taking place.
So with this particular video, I would like to sum up our, today, our talk today. So basically in China, the government, the Chinese corporations and the Chinese people have all grasped, or un, we all understand the importance of eco conservation and green development. More and more people understand what it really means by green mountains are gold mountains. Meanwhile, more and more people have given up exploitive use of natural resources but turned to the more environmental friendly ways of development by exploring the economic value of green development. At the end of the day, people want more than a wealthy life. They want a life filled with fresh air, fragrance of flower, and a scene of birds. So with this changed mindset, everyone is contributing to eco-conservation and construction in China. With joint efforts, we believe we shall achieve our shared goals for sustainable development in no time.